he was the most controversial American general of the Second World War. Dynamic, dyslexic, and with more than a touch of megalomania about him. He was General George S. Patton. Flamboyant, foul-mouthed, and perhaps the only Allied commander who could match his German opponents in the art of Blitzkrieg. But the four-star general did not long outlive the war. He was fatally injured in a road accident on the 10th of December 1945 near Mannheim in Germany. Patton's limousine collided with a US Army truck turning sharply into the concealed entrance of a supply depot. Badly injured, Patton was rushed to hospital in Heidelberg where he died 11 days later. Was he the victim of a freak accident or was there something more sinister about the death of General Patton? Patton chose to be buried with the men of the US Third Army, which he had commanded with such drive and distinction. He had been the enfant terrible of Allied commanders, an overbearing showman flaunting an ivory-handled Colt 45 in his holster. His soldiers called him Old Blood and Guts, our blood, his guts. Some historians have questioned his sanity. Patton believed he was the reincarnation of the Carthaginian general Hannibal. He was born in 1885, the son of a wealthy Californian ranch owner. At West Point Military Academy, the young Patton shone as an athlete. He also made himself extremely unpopular, obsessed with the minutiae of military dress. In spite of being dyslexic, a handicap from which he suffered throughout his life, Patton immersed himself in military history. Patton graduated well from West Point. And in 1916, he got his first taste of action, serving as aide to General Black Jack Pershing during the American raid into Mexico to deal with the bandit leader, Pancho Villa. Here, Patton rapidly gained a reputation for dash and courage. On the other side of the Atlantic, a far bigger conflict was raging. The trench warfare of the Western Front was a world away from chasing Mexican guerrillas. Patton was soon to get a taste of it. The toll taken by German U-boats eventually drew the United States into the conflict. President Woodrow Wilson declared war on Germany on the 6th of April, 1917. Pershing was appointed to command the American Expeditionary Force in France. Patton was one of a small number of officers charged with working the embryonic American tank corps into combat condition. The tank was a new weapon, blooded by the British on the Somme in 1916 and first used successfully in numbers at Cambrai in November 1917. The tanks were slow moving and vulnerable to artillery. The crews who rode in them were deafened dehydrated and half poisoned by fumes. Patton first saw action in August 1918, but in his second engagement, he was severely wounded, leading an heroic but hopeless charge against the German lines. After the war, Patton attended the newly formed tank school at Fort Meade, where one of his fellow students was his future commander, Dwight Eisenhower. The peacetime routine of army life irked Patton. Even a fancy dress party called for chain mail. Patton was only a major, but his wealthy background enabled him to indulge his tastes in horses, cars and yachts. Throughout the interwar years, Patton remained an aggressive advocate of armored warfare. He believed the tank would be the decisive weapon in any future war. Things looked up for Patton in 1940, when General Marshall, the US Army's chief of staff, launched a modernization program. Patton was to command a brigade of the newly formed 2nd Armored Division. Patton's faith in the tank had been confirmed by events in Europe. In Poland in 1939, and in France in the early summer of 1940, German panzers had provided the cutting edge of Blitzkrieg, slicing through the slow-moving armies of their enemies. American entry into the Second World War was precipitated by the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor 
on the 7th of December, 1941. GIs began arriving in Britain in February, 1942, the advance guard of a mighty army. North Africa was to be their baptism of fire and Patton's first major combat command. He was chosen to lead one of the three task forces in the torch landings in Morocco and Algeria in November 1942. Patton's Western task force went ashore at Casablanca in Morocco. His men got a hot reception from the Vichy French forces and the landing was a confused affair which reduced Patton to near apoplexy. But within 48 hours, the Vichy French had surrendered. A stiffer test for Patton lay just around the corner. For the torch landings had brought a much feared German commander hurrying back to Tunisia, the Desert Fox, Field Marshal Erwin Rommel. In February 1943, Rommel brought his Africa Corps up behind the defenses of the Marath Line and launched a well-timed counterattack which routed the raw American Second Corps in the Kazarine Pass. American artillery, British armor, and lack of fuel eventually brought Rommel to a halt, and Patton to the fore. The Allied commander, General Eisenhower, sacked the Second Corps' commanding general and replaced him with Patton. Patton quickly licked the Corps into shape, transforming it from a slovenly outfit into a tough fighting formation. More than any other Allied commander, Patton understood the mechanics of mass armies and knew how to motivate the men who served in them. Patton's fighting qualities had been quickly recognized by the Allied High Command. His reward was the command of the US 7th Army in the invasion of Sicily, codenamed Operation Husky. Radiating confidence, Patton was a man on the move. But in Husky, he bridled at having to play second fiddle to a senior battle commander, the British 8th Army's General Montgomery, the victor of El Alamey. Both men were military prima donnas, but completely opposite in character. Monty was prim and schoolmasterly, Patton the playground bully. The invasion of Sicily was the start of a bitter private war between Montgomery and Patton. In any coalition army, they were highly combustible elements. In the race to Messina, on the northeast tip of Sicily, Montgomery took the northern route while Patton struck west. Exploiting more open country, Patton drove hard for the Sicilian capital, Palermo, with impressive speed. Cheering crowds greeted 7th Army and its commander in every town. Patton savored every moment of it, took Palermo and beat his British rival to Messina by a couple of hours. But he had failed to achieve the principal strategic objective in Sicily. The Germans withdrew in good order across the Straits of Messina with much of their heavy equipment intact. For Patton, it was a hollow victory, stained by an incident which nearly wrecked his career. On two occasions in field hospitals, Patton struck soldiers suffering from what is now called combat fatigue. For Patton, the men were simply cowards who did not deserve the same care as those with more honorable physical wounds. Eisenhower ordered Patton to make a public apology to the units involved. He also made the tough decision to pass Patton over as the commander of an army group in Overlord, the invasion of Nazi-occupied Europe planned for June 1944. The job Patton craved was given to his former deputy, General Omar Bradley. Patton was given command of Third Army, which was not to be activated until after D-Day. 
During the build-up to the invasion, Patton was an army group commander, but in name only. As commander of the non-existent 1st U.S. Army Group, he played an important and highly visible part in the Allied deception plan, which successfully distracted German attention from the real objective. The Germans, including his old adversary Rommel, were fooled into thinking that Patton, the Allied armored commander they feared the most, was to lead an invasion in the Pas de Calais. Instead, the blow fell in Normandy on the 6th of June, 1944. By the end of the day, 175,000 American, British and Canadian troops had gained a foothold in Northwest Europe. It was not until early July that Third Army came ashore in Normandy. Three weeks later, they were ready for action in Operation Cobra, the American breakout from the Normandy bridgehead. During that time, Patton had been stomping around the countryside like a frustrated tourist. Now he was about to launch Third Army into Brittany in four separate armored drives. This was the kind of warfare at which Patton excelled. His limitless aggression and mastery of logistics were ideally suited to cutting clean through a dazed and demoralized enemy. By the 8th of August, his Sherman tanks were swinging east, advancing towards the Seine through Chartres and Orléans and forming the southern shoulder of an envelopment which trapped 50,000 German troops in the Falaise Gap. Viewing the carnage in the Falaise pocket, where the fields were carpeted with corpses, Patton turned to a staff officer and said that it was the most magnificent sight he had ever seen. By the 30th of August, Patton's headlong advance had carried Third Army to within 75 miles of the Rhine. He was straining at the leash to leap the river barrier into the Reich. Patton wrote in his diary, the faster we do it, the less lives and munitions it will take. With typical egocentricity, he added, no one realizes the terrible value of the unforgiving minute, except me. Patton believed that he could win the war in a matter of weeks. But Eisenhower, advancing on a broad front and struggling with fuel shortages, turned off the tap. For the moment, the bulk of the fuel was to go to Montgomery's 21st Army Group in the north. Patton fumed, and his tanks ground to a halt. Monty could scarcely conceal his delight. It required all of Eisenhower's considerable diplomatic skill to prevent open warfare breaking out between Patton and Montgomery. By the end of the war, the Allied Supreme Commander was scarcely on speaking terms with either of his unruly subordinates. In his diary, Patton wrote, to hell with Montgomery. I must get so involved with my own operations that they can't stop me. Patton spent the early winter of 1944 locked in a battle of attrition on Germany's frontier. Of the fighting in Lorraine, he wrote, I hope we insist that the Germans retain Lorraine because I can imagine no greater burden than to be the owner of this nasty country, where the whole wealth of the people consists of assorted manure piles. But Hitler was soon to come to Patton's aid. On the 16th of December, the Germans launched the Ardennes Offensive. Hitler's last desperate throw in the West. 
German armor punched a huge bulge in the weakly held Allied line. Brussels and Antwerp were threatened, and the prospect of a second Dunkirk loomed. In the space of 72 hours, Patton swung most of the Third Army through 90 degrees to charge north towards the southern flank of the bulge. The weather, already atrocious, grew worse. Patton issued a prayer of the day, beseeching the Almighty to clear the skies. The snow stopped and Allied bombers took to the air, pounding the German panzer spearheads and their supply columns. The German drive was fought to a halt short of the river Meuse. By the beginning of January, the trap had been closed on the enemy forces in the bulge. Hitler's armored reserve had been smashed and thousands of men taken prisoner. Motoring up to the front line, Patton and his drivers stopped to investigate what looked like a long line of dark twigs sticking out of the snow. They turned out to be the toes of dead soldiers, whose boots had been removed. A nasty sight, as Patton later recalled. Once more, Patton had his eyes on the Rhine. He wasn't going to let Eisenhower or Montgomery stand in his way. In what became known as the Palatinate Campaign, he raced to the Rhine on a hundred mile front from Koblenz to Mannheim, killing 37,000 Germans and capturing another 90,000 on the way. He wrote in his diary, we have put on a great show, but I think we will eclipse it when we get across the Rhine. Patton took the Rhine on the run on the 22nd of March, 1945, using assault boats he had been lugging around since the autumn of 1944. Triumphantly, he telephoned his army group commander, General Bradley. There are so few krauts around, they don't know we've crossed yet. In a whirlwind advance, Third Army drove deep into Czechoslovakia, reaching the outskirts of Prague and risking a potentially explosive confrontation with the Red Army, which was closing on the Czech capital from the east. Patton was ordered to halt. Then, under intense pressure, he was forced to pull back as the Red Army's T-34s rolled into the center of Prague. Even in the last days of the war, when the fighting was going so heavily in his favor, Patton courted controversy. On the night of the 24th of March, he sent an armored column deep behind enemy lines to a prisoner of war camp at Hamelburg, near Frankfurt. The column reached the camp but as it made its way back to the Allied lines, it was ambushed by the enemy and cut to pieces. Patton claimed that his aim had been to confuse the enemy, but it emerged that his son-in-law, Lieutenant Colonel John K. Waters, was an inmate of the camp. The suspicion remains that Patton had risked men's lives in a vain bid to rescue Waters. Peace in Europe brought no joy to Patton. His only desire was to remain in combat. He was looking forward to a command in the Pacific, but at 60, age was overtaking him. There was to be no more blood and guts. Patton was to stay in occupied Germany. He was appointed political governor of Bavaria, a post for which he was wholly unsuited. The destruction of Germany had been Patton's speciality, not its reconstruction in the aftermath of war. He continued to shoot from the hip. Patton had seen the full horror of the Nazi creed when, with Eisenhower and Bradley, he had visited the Ordruf Nord concentration camp. The sight of rooms piled high with corpses had made Patton violently sick. But he later caused outrage when he compared the Nazi party to the Republicans and Democrats in America. He was more diplomatic when he paid tribute to his veterans. 
And it occurred to me how very fortunate you are that through our blood and your bonds, we crushed the Germans before he got here. The great honor you have done me belongs to those men whom I now salute. The veterans of the third honor. On a trip to Boston in June 1945, Patton received a hero's welcome. The old soldier had always thrived on the oxygen of publicity, but it was about to be withdrawn. His public utterances became increasingly bombastic. So coming over here, there was a very great lesson. The first four hours, we passed over a destroyed land, utterly destroyed. You who have not seen it do not know what hell looks like from the top. That's what Germany looks like. That's what Austria looks like. That's what any place that the 8th Air Force and the 3rd Army worked on looks like. Back in Germany, Patton soon wearied of the peacetime routines. He became obsessed with the arms race he believed America would have to run with the Soviet Union. In his diary, he expressed the hope that he would one day fight the Mongols, as Patton called the Russians, with German veterans at his side. He wrote to his wife that their son need not worry about missing a war. The next one was on the way. Monty might fraternize with Marshals Rokossovsky and Zhukov, but Patton would have none of it. He suggested that incidents could be engineered to precipitate a decisive clash with the Soviet Union. For Patton, the only good Russian was a dead one. Patton was voicing a number of uncomfortable truths, of which the Allies did not want to be reminded. At Nuremberg, the Nazi leadership would soon face trial. But the Allies could not try all eight million former members of the Nazi party. Many of them would be needed to run post-war Germany. Punishment would be selective. Equally, the Soviet Union was already casting a long shadow over Europe. But President Truman, eager to get the GIs back home, believed he could do business with the Soviet leader, Joseph Stalin. Truman did not want a shooting war with such a recent ally. Patton couldn't wait for one. George S. Patton was the original Cold War warrior. At a time of growing tension, Truman found himself with a loose cannon on the deck in Germany. Patton had already been moved sideways to an administrative command when the accident overtook him. In hospital, he seemed to be making a good recovery. Then, suddenly, he slipped away. Was Patton removed to prevent the spark which might lead to a third world war? Patton himself had written, no one understands the terrible value of the unforgiving minute except me. Perhaps someone else did. Stalin expressed surprise at Patton's passing, but he must have been secretly pleased at the death of one of the war's most brilliant and complex commanders.